If you're around my age, there's a good chance your entire life you've watched your dream of owning a house go from what seemed like a near certainty to completely out of reach for the average person. And to be honest, I'm tired of letting that get me down. In this video, I'm taking my first step towards moving out of my parents' basement and building something I've been designing for years. A house with no fixed location, but no compromise on quality. A place to finally call home. So I'm starting off this build with a good custom built trailer that's specifically made for tiny homes. This trailer is over width at 11 by 30 feet and I decided to go over width because I'm a pretty big guy and by the time I closed in a 8 foot 6 room I'd barely be able to lay down horizontally. Plus this is going to be a fairly big unit that's not really made to travel, it'll just move when I move which will be like every few years so it's not that big a deal to get a wide load permit. The trailer has three 7,000 pound axles and weighs about 3,000 pounds itself which gives me 18,000 pounds to build my home on which should be more than enough. So the first thing I'm doing is cutting off a couple of these stabilizer jack receivers. This is going to be the front end of my tiny house right where the door is so I'm going to move these over to the side and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on this because I could have just ordered it right right from the beginning. But basically I'm just cutting off this receiver with a cutoff wheel on my angle grinder and then I'm welding it onto a section of this three inch by quarter inch square tubing and then welding that onto the frame. Then I just use some rust primer and paint and that's good as new. Now on to the actual build. I have this 2 inch rigid foam insulation that I'm going to cut up to insulate this floor. So I cut this out using a rip jig with my circular saw. as well as just some good sharp knives. So I was making sure to cut them pretty snug and then I'd mallet one piece into place and then I'd use some expanding foam to seal around all the edges and act as an adhesive. And then I'd hammer in another section of 2 inch foam until it was level with the floor framing. And I did this along both sides of the trailer. Before I add the insulation in the center, I have to raise up these ribs to be the same height as the rest of the floor. So I'm just using my table saw to cut up some 2x6s into these 2 inch sections. And then I'm basically just adding these on to the ribs as an extension so that all the framing sitting at the same height and is good to take some subfloor. I fasten these into place using some wafer head tapping screws. Now before I add in all these ribs I have to add in a couple pipes in the floor that's going to be the drain for my kitchen sink, bathroom sink and shower. So I just have some standard inch and a half ABS piping and I'm using some yellow ABS cement to glue on some elbow fittings and just extend these pipes that they're poking out of the floor so I can tap into them later. <laughs> 
So I sloped all of these pipes down to one point, which will be under the shower. And then I cut a hole through this steel belly pan. And then this will be the main out for the drain that I can tap into a septic bed or whatever I come up with later to get rid of this water. I just screwed those pipes in place using some steel strapping and then I'm ready to add the rest of those ribs. Before I get to insulating this, I'm just drilling a weep hole in each section so that any water that gets in here can escape. And then I'm ready to cut up a bunch more foam. So I'm pretty much insulating this in the exact same way. The only difference is this is actually an inch thicker here, so I added this one extra section of one inch foam board. I tried to be as exact as I could with the cuts, but there was ultimately going to be some gaps, so I just used expanding foam to seal all those up. And that's the floor insulated and ready for some subfloor. It has an insulation rating of R25 and they usually recommend about R40 for floors and houses, but this is a tiny house and you're gonna have to cut some corners, so whether you like it or not. So now it's time to add the subfloor and I have these three quarter inch chipboard tongue and groove subfloor panels. I usually hate working with OSB and I kind of ordered these accidentally, but they were here and they seemed fine, so I'm going to use them for the floor anyway. So I marked out and cut my first sheet, and then before I lay this down, I'm going to spread out some foam construction adhesive along the steel frame. This will just let the wood tack onto the steel a little better and get rid of any creaking floor or anything like that. Then I laid the panel in place, making sure it was perfectly plumb with the trailer. And I screwed it into the steel framing using some smaller wafer head tapping screws. I also added in a bunch of deck screws every foot or so along all of the wooden ribs. To cut all of my plywood panels, I used this track saw jig for my circular saw. So basically I could just measure out two marks with my tape measure and then use the track to bridge them and then I can just cut right along with the circular saw and I don't have to follow any lines or draw any lines and it just makes everything a lot faster and easier. So this tiny house build is actually the whole reason I started doing YouTube a few years ago. I was so fed up with the housing market and the longer I waited the further I got behind. When I finally decided to pull the trigger on building a tiny home, I had not nearly enough money to even start the process, so I thought how could I maybe make this worthwhile financially. I had heard a lot of people made some money on YouTube, but I honestly didn't really think it was that realistic of a thing. But I have a background in film production, so I figured hey, if I'm building stuff anyway, I might as well just start filming it, and then maybe once I start building my tiny house, I could have like 10,000 followers, and then possibly one day, my job would be on YouTube. Now it's time to start framing up my walls. So for framing I'm just using regular 2x4 lumber and I first cut up the bottom and top plate for a wall. And then I'd go ahead and mark out all the stud placement according to the blueprint. I'd basically mark out all the jack and king studs for doors and windows, and then all the middle studs I'd just do 16 inches on center starting from one end of the wall. With all the studs marked onto one board I'd just use a square to quickly transfer that over to the other plate. And then in every wall I have a bunch of these studs that are all the same length so I went ahead and cut out a bunch of those. In this case it's 7 foot 3 and a half. By the way, the blueprints for this exact tiny house are going to be on my website for free and the link's on the description below. I think it's criminal what's going on with housing right now, so I'm hoping this video can inspire some people to think outside the box and find a solution that works for you, even if it is this exact tiny house. <laughs> 
With all the studs cut to size, I set them in place and then I'm nailing all this framing together using a framing nailer and some three and a quarter inch framing nails. Then I cut up the jack studs and nailed them into the bottom plate and up the stud itself into the king stud behind it. Then I confirm my header size is the same size my blueprint says, which is six and a half inches. And then I ripped a 2x8 on my table saw and cut it to size. And then nailed in two of these boards as the header for my doors and windows. If I couldn't nail the header into place through the stud, I would just toenail it like this, and I only put two in here, but I would usually put in three or four, and I did that all later, I guess. I also nailed the two header boards together using about four vertical nails every foot or so down the header, and I don't have a clip of that, unfortunately. One last thing in this wall, I added in these short cripple studs, and then the sill plate for the window, just to complete out that framing for the window. With that done, I measured this rough opening in the window and confirmed it with the spec sheet of the window probably five times so that I made sure this was right and I wouldn't have to fix it later on. And that's one wall complete, now it's time to start working down the side. So I first made up this super simple wall using some more of those seven foot three and a half studs. And then I made up another section of this wall that's a little bit shorter because this is going to be sitting on top of the wheel well. This next section of wall is going to be two feet higher than the previous walls and then I also have this step at the bottom where the wheel well is going to drop off back to the bed of the trailer. I also had to frame three of these small windows into this wall so I used multiple headers and some spacer studs to get this done. Then I framed up the last section of this wall so there's going to be four of these sections in total to complete one side wall and then I'll nail these all together once they're all erected. So it took me two days in total to frame all the walls and that's including filming time which takes quite a bit longer so you could probably do this in a day especially if you had an extra pair of hands. I actually find this part of the build really satisfying because you make a lot of progress within about a week's time so now I have all of my walls ready to stand up. But before I do that, I'm adding my four corner jacks and I'm gonna spend a good amount of time getting this trailer bed as absolutely level as possible. You want this to be level in pretty much every area because the squareness of this entire build depends on a level trailer. Once we put up the walls, we'll be leveling them and as long as the trailer's perfectly level, the walls will be perfectly square to the trailer then. Next, I just marked out some half inch ticks to set these walls back a half inch from the trailer edge. And then I used a chalk line to snap a straight line. Then I put a bit of expanding foam along where the wall's gonna sit as some sill insulation and started lifting the wall sections into place. You're gonna need a hand when doing this because some of these walls are, I don't know, maybe 300 pounds or so. I'm just temporarily screwing each wall into place using some of these self-tapping screws. And then these will get replaced out with big half-inch bolts once all the walls are up. To support each section of wall, I'm driving a stake into the ground, 
And then I'm just using a scrap 2x4 to brace up to the wall wherever it's level. And then we just kept installing the wall sections. And in a pretty short period of time of a few hours, we went from just having a blank trailer to something that's getting pretty close to looking like a building. I'll be able to move out of my parents' basement soon. God, that'd be awesome. Where the sections got nailed together, I'd just sink a nail every foot or so. And then I'd come up on the other side of the stud and sink another set of nails every foot or so so that there's two sets with opposite angles and kind of stitching this together. With all the walls in place and braced, I'm taking out these temporary screws. And then I'm drilling through a half inch hole. And then using these half inch stainless steel bolts and washers. And then this nylon lock nut to bolt these walls down. I'd sink the bolts as tight as I could with the impact and then give them one last burst of some man energy. I put one of these bolts probably about every two or three feet down every wall, which is way overkill, but hey, they're cheap and it's better than these walls blowing off the frame. Now you want to do just one last check that everything's level and make any adjustments if you need to, and that's starting to look like a house. So the next thing I'm doing is adding a second top plate with some more 2x4s. And the most important thing with these is you want to make sure these overlap the gaps where the sections of the walls join together. This just adds quite a bit more support and kind of ties all those separate wall sections together as one. Now I'm soon going to start framing up the roof, but I first have to frame up one more little section of wall that goes on top of our one end wall. This has some space for a window in it, and it also has structural support to support the ridge beam that's going to sit on top of here. The other end's not quite as complicated, it's really just this 2x4 blocking, but this is raised up to the exact same height as the other ends so that the ridge beam will sit level. And then before I add the ridge beam, I'm going to add in a few of these 6x6 cedar tie beams. These will connect the two sidewalls together and keep the weight of the roof from bowing out the walls. And I decided to go with cedar, even though four of these 12 foot beams cost $1200, which is insane. But they smell and look so good, and they're going to be a pretty monumental part of the finished interior of the tiny house. So to cut these, I just used a regular circular saw and cut along a line on all four sides, and then just used a hand saw to finish up that cut. Then these are going to screw into another piece of 6x6 that extends up vertically up to support the ridge beam. So I marked out some bolt holes and drilled them through with a quarter inch long drill bit. And then used an inch and a half Forstner bit to make some countersinks. 
As you can hear, it was incredibly windy this day, as it was a lot of days out in the middle of this field, which made this process so much easier. So to mount these beams into the tops of the walls, I'm pre-drilling in another quarter inch hole, and then using some of these 9 inch long 3 8 inch lag bolts. Holy f that was close. Oh my god. My camera and tripod almost blew off scaffolding probably a dozen times in this build, but that was definitely the closest. Once the beam was mounted, I measured up from the floor to get the exact height of the top of the beam so that I could cut another piece that would extend upwards and meet the exact same height as those blocks we put at the two ends that support the ridge beam are at. This is just another step to making that ridge beam perfectly level. Then I set this second chunk of beam in place, making sure it was centered and used some more 3 8 inch lag bolts. Then I had two more of these to make, so I went ahead and started doing that. An important note is you want to individually measure from the floor up to the top of each one of these beams and then make a custom piece to fit the top, because each beam has a slightly different bow to it, and then you can make sure that ridge beam is supported at the exact same level at all five points. Now for the actual ridge beam itself, I'm using these nine and a quarter inch by inch and three quarter LVL beams. And I got some fairly long lengths of this. Now to secure this beam onto the end, I have these four by four post caps I'm screwing into the two by four blocking, or I'd use some strong tie nails. And for now I've just got some scrap 2x4s I'm screwing onto the sides of the 6x6s just so that the ridge beam doesn't fall off the edge. Then I started lifting the two longer lengths of ridge beam into place and this was quite the job for one person. And of course as soon as I got it up there I figured it would actually be way easier to measure this out and cut it on the ground so I took them down again. So I'm cutting in this indent, and this is for where the roof is gonna overhang over the walls. And I cut this back to be five and a half inches, so that it's just the width of a two by six overhanging out past the walls. Then this will just get covered up with soffit, and I don't have to cap it or anything on the outside. So this first side of the ridge beam will meet at that center cedar beam. And then I split this second side of the ridge beam into three pieces so that the joining points are overlapping. With all the pieces up, I nailed the LVLs together using more framing nails. And I'd do a line of nails about an inch apart, every foot or so alternating sides on each run. And now that's a pretty overkill ridge beam for what this is. One more thing I did before the sheeting goes on is I used a bunch of rolls of this steel strapping and just screwed together a bunch of the studs with diagonal angles just for some lateral support. I don't know how much this is actually going to stop it from moving, but I've seen lots of people do this in other videos, so I thought I might as well. To be honest though, the steel's pretty flimsy and I think the plywood would offer a more lateral support as long as it's nailed properly, but for the price this costs, better safe than sorry, I guess. But here's a good clip of how much a stud moves that's supported at two points, and one that's not supported at all. Now the next step is I'm going to install the sheathing around all the walls. 
I'm just using some half inch standard plywood. You can use OSB if you want, it's a little bit cheaper. I just prefer plywood because it seems more soundproof and rigid and it just feels like a better constructed home when you're inside it. And then we just set the sheet on that little half inch ledge we left when we put on the walls and just tacked it in place with some two and a half inch framing nails. Then we just started filling in all the rest of the sheets. Also, thanks to my brother who was around because this is definitely not a one man job and he helped out whenever I needed some extra hands. So sheathing actually doesn't get put on tight. It has a slight gap between all the sheets. So I just use one of the nails, which is about an eighth of an inch thick to space the gap between all the sheets. To permanently nail off every sheet, I would go four inches between each nail around the perimeter of the sheet. And on the interior studs, I'd mark a line with the level and then follow this line with nails every six inches. Seems like a lot of nails and it is, but this is really what gives everything its strength and stops any sheer forces. Or at least so I'm told, I really don't know, I've never built anything even remotely close to this before, so keep that in mind this whole time. The second layer goes on pretty much the exact same way as the first, you just gotta remember not to end your sheet on the same stud so that all those gaps are offset. And we'd also use some spare nails to maintain that eighth inch gap around every edge of the sheet when we're setting the top layer in place. There's a few ways to cut out the windows now, but the easiest method I've always found is to drill out the corners with a drill bit. And then from the outside, I'm going to use this palm router and this flush trim router bit. And this will just cut through the plywood while the bearing on the end of the router bit rides along the 2x4 framing and won't let me cut in any further. You get an exact cut to the dimensions of the opening in the frame and you really don't have to do any thinking at all. It's a pretty convenient way to cut out a bunch of windows in short order without doing any measuring and these router bits are only like 30 bucks. Oh yeah, and did I mention there's a lot of windows to cut out? I think there's like 16 or 17. Basically a full house worth of windows in 300 square feet. It was also another $20,000 for the windows, but what are you gonna do? My basement right now has zero windows. Before I could finish up the sheathing, I had to finish up framing the top of this end wall. So I use one of the template rafters I'm going to make up in the next step to help me get the angle that I can frame this wall to. And then I framed in the rest of this octagon window and added in some studs. One last step before I get to framing out the roof, I'm gonna add the house wrap right now. So we're just going around making this as tight as possible and just tack it into place with staples. And then wherever there's a vertical seam, we use some blue tuck tape to tape this down. Then I just cut off any excess. When you're doing house wrap, you always want to start at the bottom and work your way up. That way it has the right layering to shed water properly. Again, I'm taping the vertical seams. These horizontal seams don't need any because they're overlapped properly and the water's not going to travel uphill to get behind this. Now I'm going to cut a template truss for the steeper part of the roof. So I have this whole thing designed on the computer, so I just spit out these dimensions so I don't have to actually measure it on site. 
So first I set my miter saw to the angle it said, which is 33 and a half degrees, and then I cut off one of the ends of this fresh eight foot two by six. Then I measured from the cut point as long as it said this rafter is supposed to be, and I cut a second angle at this point. Now I'm going to cut out this bird's mouth, so to do that I just measure the point where it starts. And then this drawing told me the length of each cut is 2 and an eighth inch and 3 and 3 sixteenth inch, so I just used a square and measured this out with the edge of the wood. And then traced the line and cut this out with my circular saw. Then I used a reciprocating saw to finish up that cut. Now as long as this fits right, this will be my template for all the other rafters and I won't have to individually measure each one, which will save a lot of error. And it looks like it's sitting along the ridge beam at the perfect angle and sitting nicely on the top plate, so this looks like a good template. So I took it down and traced it onto a bunch of fresh 2x6s just to make a whole bunch of these rafters. It's important when tracing these that you always use the same template piece and even have the same face up so that you're always tracing that same edge. Now before I install these rafters I have to mark out the placement so I'm just marking out the ridge beam every two feet on center. And I'm putting the tick 3 quarter inch offset so that the center of the board will be right on the 2 foot mark. And same thing with the top plate. Now I can just start installing all of my pre-cut rafters. To mount these onto the ridge beam I'm using one of these Simpson rafter ties. And screwing it in with some structural strong tie screws. And that's as easy as it is to set these rafters into place. To attach each rafter onto the top plate of the wall, I'm using these Simpson truss screws. And these just replace our hurricane strap and they're a lot quicker option and not that much more expensive. So they come with this little guide, so I just set that in place and then start the screw. And then remove the guide and keep sinking this screw until the head isn't protruding out anymore. And that's all we need to secure the bottom of each rafter onto the walls. That's now a structural connection. At least that's what the guy at the hardware store tells me. I really have no experience doing any of this. Now I'm just making up a template for the second portion of the roof. And once it fits, just making up a bunch more rafters. When I got to the point that the two slopes merged, I decided to take these structural screws out because they have a pretty big popping out head on them and replace them with nails. And then I can just butt this second board up right against it and give it a couple screws. And then I just gave this piece a hurricane strap. Another tip, after I put up the first few pieces, I noticed that the overhang wasn't actually the exact same for every single rafter, so I actually started cutting them about an inch long. And then I'd just tack the rafters up with one screw, and then I'd just use a 2x4 since my preferred overhang is 3.5 inches to mark the cut line. Then I'd just take them down, cut them, and then put them up permanently. And then they all have the exact same overhang. While I was up here, I also took off those temporary chunks of 2x4 and replaced it with a steel strap. Now I set the angle on my circular saw at the slope of the roof, which is 33 and a half degrees, and I ripped off the edge of a 2x8. And then I marked out every two foot on center and attached these little 
tiny pieces are after. Then I snapped a level line and screwed up these pieces to continue that slope all the way around this higher section of building. Then I ripped an angle into another 2x8. And I made sure the face on this piece was 5.5 inches, just because that's the width of a 2x6 and is a pretty standard measurement to, for getting fascia later on. And then I screwed in these little brace things I made up since I'm working alone today. And I nailed these boards on as the fascia board. Notice I left a good couple feet overhanging out the end of this board, and that's because I'm going to connect this with one more rafter up to the ridge beam and be the overhang of the roof. Now I'm going to create that overhang, so I'm measuring out how much that ridge beam is protruding out, and then transferring that on to the fascia board. Then I'm cutting up one more rafter using that same old template, but not cutting in the bird's mouth this time. And screwing and nailing that in to be the fascia board of this gable end. Then I just squared off a line and used a circular saw to cut this board flush. At the other end I first nailed on this rafter that has a couple of these ribs coming out. And then I added on that last rafter as the gable end. Then I have a rafter for the lower slope part and I'm just tacking this on to the end and then screwing this on to the face of the rafter below it. Then I went up top and just traced this line and then took the board down to cut this with my circular saw. Now I can take this board back up and nail it in permanently at the end. And then this is just sitting on the rafter below it, so I'm just going to nail it snug onto that. Now on each of these overhangs, I'm just adding a couple pieces of block in that extends into the frame of the roof just a stud or two. And this will just give it a little more support on that overhang. Then I also added these couple boards as a rough opening for a skylight that's going to be right here. And I also had to frame in these tiny little walls where the slope and the roof changed. And that's the entire framing for this tiny house. Now complete, a little more sheeting and we're pretty much closed in. To sheet the roof, I'm using that same half inch plywood and I'm pretty much doing this in the exact same method that I did the walls. 
I'd use a scrap piece of 2x4 and screw it into the fascia board just so the plywood wouldn't go down any further than the edge of that board. And I nailed these sheets down to each rafter with about a 4 inch gap between nails. I also use these sheathing clips between each rafter which gives me that 8th inch gap and it also kind of binds the two pieces together and gives them a little bit more support. I'd screw a couple scrap 2x4s onto the roof to give me something to stand on while we were putting on the upper sheets. And a lot of these end sheets I would leave a little bit long and just trim them off with the trim router that I used to cut out the windows so it would have an exact fit. And then we just kept picking away sheet after sheet. Also, I never really knew this about myself, but I absolutely hated it up there. I don't know if it's because I could fall through the rafters or just slide off the roof or what, but this day specifically, I absolutely hated it up there. That sucked. The good news is we're pretty much closed in, and while there's a lot to do for cosmetics on the exterior yet, it's actually fully structurally done. At this point, it's right around Labor Day, and I'm actually waiting on the roof and siding and stuff to come in, which is going to take about four or five weeks, so I'm going to work on some more pressing projects for a bit. And wow, that was a quick month. So the next step is to waterproof the roof, and this definitely should have been done before I took that month-long break, but I didn't have the material on hand at the start, and once I get working on something else, I really don't quit until it's done. And I needed a damn solar-powered car. Either way, the roof plywood was fine exposed to the sun for a few weeks. So this is some stick-down roofing membrane, and I'm going to be putting a metal roof on here. So this is a really good thick underlay that is actually pretty much waterproof just itself. Pretty straightforward how you put this on, it's just got a plastic film on the back that covers up the adhesive, so I'd just cut a strip to a rough length because the rolls are pretty heavy. And then we'd set that roughly in place on the roof and then we'd pull back that plastic strip to expose the adhesive and just press it down as firm as we could. A couple things to note, you obviously want to start at the bottom and work your layers up so that it's layered properly to shed water. And for any corners I'd just make a cut like this and then patch on another piece. I'd also leave enough excess to stick it three or four inches up the wall like it is here. And a lot of people are gonna say this should be tucked in behind the house wrap, but this stuff's really sticky and expands when it gets wet and professional roofers told me this is fine, so I guess it's fine. If you're really watching here, you'll notice that I'm actually stapling down the lower portion of this membrane. So I actually did this on all the sheets that are down near where the drip edge is gonna be. I'd actually leave on about six inches of this white plastic on this lower edge so that the drip edge can be slid underneath here and then that plastic can be removed and stuck on top of the drip edge. In a perfect world, I'd have all the materials here for the roof so I could start doing it in the next step, but that's the way it goes when you're building big stuff. Now I'm going to start working on the soffit and the first thing I have to do is just take off these little bits of wood that are overhanging past the bottom of the fascia board. So I just use my oscillating multi-tool for that. And then I'm going to square off the bottom of these gables by making a bird box. So I'm just cutting a scrap piece of wood with that same 33 and a half degree angle. and then measuring it to the size I want it to be, which is at five and a half inches. Then after I make sure that's sitting level, I can screw and nail that into place with some impeccable form. Then I added in these two pieces of wood just to complete the bottom edge of this box. I also added in any more boards that I'm gonna need for when I have to nail in the soffit. 
Since this is such a small space, I decided not to compromise on any fine details I could do on the exterior, so for the soffit I have this clear cedar tongue and groove paneling. This stuff is ridiculously expensive, like $8 a linear foot, but in my opinion on a small space like this I think it's really worth that extra time and money to give it any detail that'll make it pop out. So I first ripped one of these boards to the starting width I need and then cut it to the length. And then I'm starting at this back end because it's always best to start somewhere that's not the main focal point when you don't know what you're doing. Before I put the soffit on, I just ran this wire through here and then ran it into the house. I'm not hooking it up to anything right now, I just want this in here in case I ever want to add lights back here. But for right now, I'm just going to tuck this up in the framing and then start nailing on my soffit. Once again, this is a pretty small rectangular house, so I decided to get pretty detailed with my miter cuts and make everything pop as much as possible. I'd also sand every board with 150 grit before it goes up because it's a lot easier to do this on the ground. So to nail these boards in, I'm using a 15 gauge nailer. And in the first board, I'd put a nail right up against the wall as close as possible. And then once the siding's installed, this nail hole will be covered and you won't see anything. Next, I'd sink a nail on an angle in through the tongue of this board. And then once the next board is installed, this nail disappears. So any middle boards will only need those tongue nails, but this runs only two boards wide. So once I got to the end, I would just sink a nail as close to the edge as possible. And then once the fascia cover goes on, this will also get covered up and there won't be any exposed nail heads. With the back end installed without a hitch, I'm now more confident to do the front end. So I'm first running a wire along here and then all along this one side since this is kind of the front face. And there's definitely going to be some lights in here. So once I got to the middle board, this board's going to have my first light in it, so I drilled a two and a half inch hole, which is the right size for the pot light that I have. And these are just an indoor-outdoor pot light, and these have a gimbal so I can actually angle these down. So after making sure it fits the hole, I took the board up to install it. And then I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on installing this light because I'll do that more on the next video where we start closing in the inside and I go over all the electrical. But basically I just pop the light into place and then cut this bulge of wire I had just run through the framing here. And then I just stripped each of those wires back about a half inch or so. And then it's pretty simple to connect this. You just connect all the wires with these three-way wire connectors. All the black wires in one, all the white wires in one, and all the ground wires. Before I could extend this down the sidewalls, I had to cut these pieces of 2x4 and just nail them in place along the wall level with the bottom of the fascia board. That gave me something to nail to on both ends of these short 5 inch pieces. After these short pieces get closed in with the siding and then the overhang of the fascia covering, there's really only going to be about 3.5 inches of this exposed. And the lumber for this soffit costs $2,000, which just gives you an idea of how much this clear cedar costs. Honestly though, it is really a statement piece. In person, that's one of the first things that most people notice. A soffit needs to vent to work properly, so every fourth piece or so I made one of these vent pieces, so I printed up this 3D printed pilot hole template and drilled all the pilot holes with a small drill bit. 
Then I'd used a 3 8 inch Forstner bit and just bore out every single one of these holes and I had to make about 68 of these pieces. It took about 5 minutes to make each vent so yeah that's pretty much a full day of drilling these. Again though all about that attention to detail. With a piece fully drilled out I would just staple on a piece of window screen onto the backside just so bees and bugs can't get in. I installed four more lights along this front side saw fit, and these are slightly different than the other lights, but they're pretty much the exact same idea. I just needed something a little smaller to fit in this narrow gap. With the lights and saw fit installed, I just used some wire nuts to connect this onto an old extension cord and then plug this into an AC power source just to see if my lights turn on. And now that's looking pretty sweet. This cedar's gonna need some sort of protective oil, but I'm gonna be doing another cedar accent piece, so I'll cover that later on. So now it's time to start installing all of my windows. These are all just regular house windows with one key difference, they're all tempered glass. Since this is gonna be on the road and bouncing around, just normal plate glass would break pretty easily and tempered will be able to stand up to those forces. So to install these, I first found one of the window openings and then along the side, I cut just about an inch back from this opening. Same with the bottom and the other side and then the top I cut flush along the opening. Then I measured the sill, which for this window is 29 inches and then I'm gonna cut up a piece of this six inch flashing tape, six inches longer than that measurement, so 35 inches, roughly. I'd then just stick this onto the wall about halfway along the bottom of the opening and cut along the edge here until I reach the sill and fold this part over. I'd then cut another piece the exact same length and install this onto the sill instead and fold over onto the wall. And then normally that'd be good for flashing tape, but there's actually something wrong with my windows. So on this, I'm gonna install these strips of flashing tape along both vertical edges as well. So I'm not sure where there was a miscommunication when I ordered these windows, but normally every new build window has a little piece of plastic that comes off the side of the window here with a bunch of holes so you can nail it into the wall. This is called a nailing fin or a nailing flange and almost every new window has this nowadays so I'm not sure why mine didn't come and the company itself offered no support at all so that's awesome. I'm going to show you how I installed my windows but it's not going to be of much use to many people so I'll do another one after this that explains uh, with a more traditional window. So first inside the window opening I did install these blocks that have the correct spacing that would stop the window from going in too far. Normally the nailing flange would do that, but again, you know, I'll just explain this useless information. So then I'd use some half inch chunks of plywood and then just shim them until I could get them absolutely as level as possible because that's going to save me a lot of work later. So then I'd lift the window into place and just kind of make sure it was even in both sides of the gap in the rough opening. And then with my brother holding it snug on the inside, I would just check the reveal and make sure it was the same in all four corners. I did the same with the level on all four sides, making sure they're all sitting nice and level. And then I'd just use some door and window shims to shim this window snug. On the inside, I just took some normal deck screws and then went in through this jam extension and screwed in straight through the shims to secure the window in place. Windows aren't structural at all, so these are really only held in with about four to six screws. Notice in this clip, the shims are only along the two sides. You never want to shim the top or the bottom. And then depending on the height of the window, this one had six shims. Some of the smaller ones would only have four. On the outside, I'd cut away those overhanging shims. And then the huge problem with these windows not having a nailing fin was that I'm left with this half inch gap around the whole window. 
I could literally find no information on filling this gap, so I'm just gonna do what I think will work. So I used a bunch of flashing tape, and I started at the bottom, and I would just fold this over about three quarters of an inch onto the frame of the window, and then stick the rest onto the wall. So I started with the bottom first, and then worked up both sides. Online, some people suggested using a butyl caulking to fill this gap, but these are pretty wide gaps and have a lot of windows, so that's more caulk than I have to give this house. Once I got to the top, I'd cut away the house wrap with about a 45 degree angle into both corners of the window, and then just tape it up out of the way for a few minutes. And then I'd flash the top of this window the same as I did the three other sides. Again, this is really time consuming and it's all because these windows don't have a nailing fin, so just stick around a few minutes, I'm going to install one that does, because there's like a 99.9% .9 chance the windows you get are going to have a nailing fin. But now with those sealed up, this window will now be the same as any other window, so I have this piece of metal drip edge, and I'm just cutting it to the exact width of the window, and then I'm setting this down on top of the frame of the window and nailing it in place with some inch and a quarter roofing nails. Then I'd bring that house wrap back down over top and just use some house wrap tape to tape along these seams. Back at the bottom, I'd just use a knife to cut in a few of these tiny little weep holes just so that if any water does get in behind this flashing tape, it can all drain out at the bottom. And again, that's only for my windows, not yours. And that's an installed window that should theoretically shed water properly. Okay, so real quick before we move on, I just bought another window from Home Depot that has one of these nailing fins and I'm just going to show you how to install it really quickly so that this video pertains to everybody. So with my window opening flash the same way I did the other window, just minus those two strips of vertical flashing along the two sides that I don't need with this window. I did the same thing blocking the bottom and making sure it was level. And then I'm just taking my window and I'm putting a silicone bead around the inside of this nailing fin all the way around the whole window. The only place I don't put any is I leave a couple of two inch gaps along the bottom so that any water that gets in behind this window can escape. Then I just set the window into place and after I make sure it's level, I just nail this off with about two or three nails per side. Then I'll just take some flashing tape and I'll put two strips up along the sides as well as one across the top. After this, I did the exact same thing with that drip edge and then putting the house wrap over top and taping up those seams. This took about one quarter of the amount of time. I probably could have did all the windows in one day in my tiny house rather than four days if they all had this nailing fin. But anyway, no sense crying over spilled milk. Let's just get the rest of these windows installed. So back to that story I was telling like an hour ago about how I got started on YouTube. At the time I had some failing businesses and I was basically just building stuff to make any extra cash and then filming videos in hopes that maybe that would be an avenue to make some money as well. I literally had a goal to make like $2,000 a month a few years down the line so that I could at least buy my groceries. I noticed there was a huge void in DIY videos of actual production value and you'd be watching something trying to figure out how to do it and all of a sudden they would skip forward in time and miss the step that you really needed to know how to do. And it's that simple idea that I've tried to keep ever since, trying to explain every single step of the way and show people that as long as you have resilience, it's really not that hard to build whatever you can imagine. To be honest, I've done almost none of this before. I just watch YouTube videos every night and figure out what I'm doing the next day. So now it's time to install my front door, and the funny thing about this door is this actually came with a nailing fin on it, and most of the time they don't, so I don't know what they were smoking at this window factory, but it's certainly not the same stuff I am. So I cut out the house wrap around this door opening, pretty much the exact same way as the window opening, there's just no bottom on it. And then I use my multi-tool to cut away the bottom board of this wall and the door opening. Then I just use one strip of flashing tape along the bottom here, 
and it didn't really need these, but I added two strips of vertical flashing because I'd done it on all the windows already. Now, similar to the window I showed you with the nailing fin, I just used some window silicone to seal around this fin. And then I placed a good thick bead of silicone along the front edge of that door pan as well. I also used some PL construction adhesive and put a generous amount along the back side of that door pan. Then we can lift the door into place. Now working on the inside, I had a good amount of shims on hand because this is going to take quite a few and I'm just shimming the door frame as level as I can get it. And then this door came with a whole bunch of these pre-drilled pockets for screws. So I would just shim in behind these and then pre-drill a hole for the screws they send along with the door and screw those into place. You also have to shim in behind your hinges and then screw in these long screws through the hinges as well. A door obviously takes a lot more abuse and slamming than a window, so there's quite a few screws that need to go in here. Two go into every hinge, and then I'd say there's probably about 10 more that secure the frame elsewhere. This takes quite a bit of tinkering with shims and screws, but after about 10 or 20 minutes, you should be able to get the door to a point where it opens and closes as smooth as possible and doesn't drag on any of the edges. And you should have a pretty even gap around the entire door. With the door all functioning properly, I just put in a roofing nail into this nailing flange every foot or so around the frame. And then I flashed up both sides and the top of the door. And added that metal drip edge and overlapped the housing wrap the same way I did on the windows. Now I have some window and door expanding foam and I'm just going around on the inside filling in all the gaps between the rough openings and the jams of the door and windows. This is a pretty easy self-explanatory task. I just had to be really careful on the windows that I didn't overfill and the expanding foam wouldn't bulge out the flashing tape since I don't have anything rigid like the nailing fin to hold it back. But again, that most likely is not going to be a concern of yours. And after that cured up for a couple hours, I could take my multi-tool and just cut away the shims. And use a good sharp utility knife to cut off all the excess of this expanding foam. And hey, we're uh, starting to look like a house in here. I've literally been designing this for like two years. One last step with this door, I just installed a keypad lock and the handle and these come with directions in the box so I'm not gonna explain you how to do this because this video is already way too f***ing long. So now I've just got some normal cedar 4x4s and I'm going to make up some timber frame accent piece things. So I'm just cutting up a few lengths that I need and then I'm just using my planer just to take maybe a sixteenth of an inch off of each of these faces just to give it a nice square look and not look like it's a lumberyard 4x4. Then I turn the blade on my table saw to the 33 and a half degree slope of the roof. And then I'm just taking an edge off of these 4x4s. Why I didn't have the fence over an eighth of an inch so it would have cut this clean through, I don't know. I guess I just wanted to use the handsaw. Then I use my miter saw just to cut some nice looking angles off of these pieces. 
By the way, I'm using a 60 tooth finish cut blade on my miter saw. That'll save you a lot of work. So these two pieces are gonna go together in an L and then I'm gonna have another 45 degree piece connecting them. So I just measured that up. And then I cut those pieces and fed them through the planer a bunch of times until they went down from about three and a half inches square to two and a quarter inches square. A bandsaw would work better if you have one, but I don't, so it really wasn't that big a deal for a 15 minute job. Then I cut these thinner pieces to length with 45 degree angles at each end. And it should fit in place here nicely like this. So after I gave everything a sand with some 150 grit, I started assembling my two timber pieces. I decided to do this as simple as possible because this is like a thousand step build so I don't want to get any complicated joinery or anything. So I just pre-drilled some holes and then I'm just fastening these two main pieces with some five inch deck screws. Then after I made sure it's squared I marked out the position for this 45 degree piece and screwed it in from the back with some more deck screws. This is just a visual piece, it's not structural at all, so these deck screws are going to be fine. So then I pre-drilled a hole for a big structural bolt and then use a Forstner bit to make a countersink. And then I'm going to fasten these timber pieces onto the wall using these structural screws that don't have a terrible looking head on them because they're going to be exposed. So I used two of those big structural screws to screw this into place. And then I just used a few more deck screws in through the back just to keep the piece from rotating or anything. And those are some nice little timber accent beams done. At this point it's nearly the end of October and I'm getting pretty pressed for time here to get this done before our cold Canadian winters set in. So next I'm on to siding, and you're going to notice some of the roof actually gets put on in the meantime, but I'll cover that later. I had to start kind of combining steps when I could get help because the winter was coming. So I just have this regular vinyl board and batten siding, and I have some of this in white and black, but I'll be starting with the white. And the first thing I need to do is put on these corner posts. So for this siding company specifically, I had to measure out three inches on both sides of the corner at the top and bottom of the wall. Then I just tacked a nail on one of these ticks up at the top and used my chalk line to pull that down and line it up with the line at the bottom and just snap myself a nice straight line. Then I had to measure my corner post to length and then I cut it out using some aviation snips. This stuff can be a little tricky to cut because of all the complex curves and bends, but you can just cut pieces out of the scrap side of the piece and then that makes it a lot easier to get your shears in there. But in the end, the bottom of the piece looks something like this. Then I just brought that corner post over onto the corner of my tiny house and lined it up with my chalk lines on each side. I'd use a roofing nail and the first nail I'd put at the very top of this nailing slot. This just holds the post up tight against the soft fit and allows any expansion to expand downwards. And then all the rest of the nails I put right in the center of the slot. With siding you also don't nail it completely tight. With these trim pieces I'm nailing them so that there's just the ever so slightest amount of play in them. And you should be able to wiggle it a little bit underneath every single nail head. You don't want to nail anything tight with siding because it contracts and expands with the heat. So you always want a little bit of room for it to move with these trim pieces. The next piece of trim I used and the piece that gets used to trim almost everything else is called J trim because it looks like a J. So along the bottom I'd snap another straight line at the height I needed it at. 
and then I'd tack in my J trim at one end and then starting from the other end, I would just sink a nail every foot or so, right in that J channel as level on that line as I could. Again, I put these nails all in the center of the nailing slots and left them just slightly loose so it can wiggle back and forth a little bit. This vertical to horizontal transition has a certain way everything needs cut to shed the water properly, and it's actually the exact same way you trim the windows, which I'm going to cover in a couple minutes, so you can apply that information here. I also could spend probably 45 minutes on covering the siding alone. I'm kind of condensing this, so this isn't a six hour long video, but I'll put a couple links in the description below of videos I use to learn how to side, because of course this is my first time siding. With the J trim installed along the bottom of an entire wall, I'd just take a 3 16th inch drill bit and just drill some weep holes every 18 inches or so. So the siding panels need trim on every single edge, so I'm also trimming up around the top here. And again, this is going to use the exact same concepts that I'm going to show you trimming out a window in a minute or two, or three or five. Whew. This is a six day of editing, driving me crazy. By the way, maybe six hour long videos are something you're interested in, or maybe 15 minute long, I don't know. Let me know in the comments below what you think, if this is the right length, or too long, or too short, or what you're thinking. I just want to know you guys. So to trim out a window, or really anything else, you always start at the bottom first, and I'd measure the width of our window. And then I'd add on an inch and a half to account for the three quarter inch wide J trim that's going to be on each side. So then I'd cut this line square using some aviation snips. And then I'd just use a scrap piece of J trim here to mark a cut line on both ends of my piece. Then I'd use my snips again and make two cuts along the corners here. And then bend this tab back and cut it off. Then this piece should sit in place on the bottom of the window like this, with the two cutout openings lining up perfectly with the edge of the window. Then I'll just nail in this piece loosely for now and measure up the side pieces. I'd do the same thing as the bottom piece, measuring the height of the window and then adding on that inch and a half to account for the face of the J channel at each end. And then the top end I'd cut the exact same as I did that bottom piece. And the bottom end I'd cut almost the exact same, I'd just bend that tab over and then I wouldn't cut it off. And then I'd just make a roughly 45 degree cut on the face of the J trim. This tab then slides inside that bottom piece of J trim and the miter covers up that seam nicely. I also had to paint in the cut off corners of these windows black later, I'm not sure why they had to be cut off, but if they did, why were they not at least black? So I just tack the two side pieces in place with a couple of nails. For the top piece, both ends are cut with that exact same cut I just did with the tab bent over and the 45 degree miter. Also if it's not sitting quite flush on top of the window and has a little bit of an air gap, you can just trim down those side vertical pieces a little bit until that top piece of J trim sits on there snug. Then I'd go around nailing in all that J trim in about one foot increments. And here's a good clip of how that bent over tab kind of seals up that gap between the two pieces of trim and allows as little water as possible to go through. And that's how you trim a window for siding, and the same way you have trimmed pretty much everything else on here. Siding will never be 100% waterproof, and there's always house wrap to catch anything that does make it through the little gaps. Now with a few walls trimmed, I'm pretty much ready to start installing siding panels. So the first thing I need to do with a fresh panel is just measure the width I need it at and then rip this lengthwise. This is going to be my starter strip that begins the run of a wall. 
So after I check that that fits with about a half inch of play up and down, I have to take this out so that I can install some of this sill trim. The purpose of this sill trim is to hold this cut edge in place and not allow it to flap around in the wind or anything like that. So I installed a strip of this right on the inside of this corner post, pushing it in as far as it would go. And again, I nailed it pretty snug, but not too tight, so it still has about a half inch of vertical play in it. Now before I install that starter piece, I'm just using the snap lock punch to punch a tab every two feet or so. And then just sliding that in place inside of that sill trim. After I made sure that piece was level, I nailed it off every 16 inches or so. And then continued adding pieces. To make an angled cut, I'd just measure my one side measurement, and then using my speed square, I'd just turn it on this mark using it as the pivot point, until it was at about that 33 and a half degree slope of the roof. Then I'd just mark this line and cut this out using my aviation snips. Then I could slide this panel into place and interlock it with the panel next to it. And then I just want to make sure there's about a 3 8 to half an inch play in this panel up and down because it's only about 8 degrees out when I'm filming this and it's going to expand quite a lot once it's about 35. These panels I'm nailing quite a bit looser than the trim and they should be easily able to play up and down. I'd generally start nailing up at the top and I would just push it right up to the top of the J trim and then drop it about an eighth inch and then put my first nail right at the top of that first full nailing slot. All the rest of the nails along the panel are in the center of each nail in slot and about 16 inches apart. Once I got to the last piece of a wall, I had to install another piece of that sill trim to catch the cut edge. And then I'd just slide that last piece into place and this one actually doesn't have any nails in it at all. I also added in a bunch of these exterior receptacles. So first inside, I would just drill through on the corner of a stud, and then I'd find that drill hole on the outside and put up this piece of the receptacle to trace the cut hole. And then I'd just cut that out with my multi-tool. Then I'd just nail in this siding shroud that came with the receptacle, and this just replaces the J-trim I'd have to put around it otherwise. And then I can just use some house wrap tape to tape up the sides and then overlap that flap of house wrap back over top and tape it down. I just installed the boxes right now. I didn't install the actual receptacles. I'll cover that once we do the inside in the next video. Around doors or windows or anything else that interrupted a full panel, I would just take a tight measurement and then subtract about a quarter to three-eighth of an inch depending on the temperature. This will leave a nice size gap around every obstruction and give that panel lots of room to expand still. That sill trim also gets installed along the sides of any longer vertical cutouts like the sides of the windows. By the way, I'm about to hit a million subscribers which is absolutely insane. I want to thank every single one of you for that. Like I said earlier, building this tiny house was kind of the reason I started doing YouTube in the first place. I wanted to have a little bit of a following by the time I built it, but I never imagined it would be a million people. And I got lots of cool ideas still left in the tank after this, so if you haven't hit the subscribe button, do that now. And now my roof finally arrived, so we can start putting that on. By the way, I know I said earlier on that the main rule of this channel is to describe every single step in good detail. And unfortunately I'm going to have to bend that rule a little bit with this roofing section because I didn't really know what I was doing so I had a couple friends that are roofers help me put it on. I'll still explain roughly what we're doing but I decided to just learn on this one and then in a future project where I'm doing a metal roof I can do a more full tutorial then. So we're first installing the drip edge along all the lower edges of the roof 
And this is why I left some of the white plastic on the bottom of this roof underlay so that I could lift it up out of the way to screw in the drip edge. And then we can pull that white plastic off and then stick this underlay right down on top of the drip edge. And then we installed this gable edge trim and cut a nice miter where they met. And by we, I mean Joel did everything. Then we had to install this starter trim around all the points where the roof met into the wall. And that's all the trim done on one Saturday and the next Saturday they came over to help me put on the panels. So these are pretty straightforward to install. Once the trim's all installed, they really just snap together and the next sheet always covers up the previous sheet screws. We also had to prep every sheet by cutting off about an inch of these ribs and capping them, and then bending around this bottom portion of the sheet so it would hook onto the drip edge. We also had to install that skylight. And they did all of this. I have no idea what they did, so we're gonna have to wait for another video for me to describe to you how to install a skylight, because I have no fing idea. With all the sheets installed, we had to install the ridge cap, and I messed up and ordered these sheets a couple inches too short, so we had to get in a way bigger ridge cap to cover that up. But first we had to stick these foam sealer things onto the ribs, and cut away a bit of that underlay so that the roof can vent. Then we put the ridge cap into place and started screwing it into place into each rib. And now that's a finished standing seam metal roof. Again, I wish I had more detail to give you on this, but I'm only as good as the YouTube videos that already exist, and there wasn't much on installing standing seam roofs, so we'll save it for the next one. So now I still have this one side wall that hasn't been sided yet, and we just had our first snowfall of the season. So I didn't put any side in on this wall yet because I'm going to be building a cedar accent piece along this three window stretch here. So I'm just measuring out the lines I'm going to need to start the trim for this piece. And then I could really only measure the top section so I have this laser level and I'm going to line it up with that top line. And then just make a couple ticks along this line and extend it down onto the lower portion of this wall. 
So now I have these clear cedar 2x4s, and these are sitting at an inch and a half thick. But I'm just going to take a few passes off the back side with my planer. And bring that down to an inch and a quarter. This is just how far I wanted it to stick out from the wall for no real reason other than that's what I determined. Then I cut my first piece to length. And then I'm going to be screwing this into the wall so I'm measuring out some screw placement just to make it look pretty and precise. And then I'm using a 3 8 inch Forstner bit to countersink these holes about halfway into the board. I just put anywhere from 2 to 4 in each board depending on the length. Now I can just line the edge of this board up with that vertical line I drew. And just trim this piece out. Around the corner I just used another chunk of that same piece of 2x4 so the color matches and glued it onto that edge and screwed it into the wall. After this gets a light sanding in a later step you'll barely even see this seam. Then I just ripped a thinner section of 2x4 and used a 8 inch roundover bit in my router just to soften that square edge. I also routed out a few of these grooves in the back side of the board because these are going to be horizontal so that when water gets in behind here it can still escape from behind the wood. And then I just finish nailed these smaller pieces into place. Now I don't have a drill press but I have a buddy that has one that looks like he uses it a lot. And then I have these 3 8 inch dowel cutting drill bits. And then I'm just going to use this to drill press a bunch of dowels out of those same chunks of 2x4s. Then you can just break off the dowel. And I just put a little bit of glue in these countersunk screw holes and then malleted the dowel into place. I'll come back later and cut these off and sand them and you'll barely even see them. I also just cut up some scrap 2x4s into some quarter inch sections to be some furring strips. And these just raise out that tongue and groove panel in an extra quarter inch to get them at the reveal I wanted them at. And now I can start installing a bunch more clear cedar tongue and groove. I started at the bottom with the tongue going upwards and then each layer would just get set in place on top of the last. And I'd use my 15 gauge nailer to nail in through every furring strip in through that tongue again. Then once the next board goes into place those nails disappear. To go around a window as exact as possible I'd set the board in place and then mark the edge of the window. Then I just measure up that gap for how far it needs to be cut back and then mark that out and cut it out with my jigsaw. And that was a pretty satisfying day of work. I absolutely love the way this looks with no knots or no exposed nails, it's super clean. Oh, and back to those dowels, I just used my multi-tool to cut off most of the dowel. And then I used some 150 grit sandpaper to finish sand that. It cost me a couple grand just to do this little piece, but it's literally what everybody talks about as soon as they come up and talk to me about it. And a lot of people do. While I was filming this, if it was a nice sunny day, I would have probably five or six people stop in every day and talk to me. And this took a while to film, you know, like two and a half months or so. Lots of curious people out there. The next day I protected this wood piece with some Osmo UV protection oil. And pretty self-explanatory, I just brushed this on. Also, this is a brand new song my band just put out, so 
I'm just gonna let this play for a bit while I finish up a bunch more of these details. And hey, you might recognize this guy's voice. With one coat applied, this stuff needs at least two, so the next day I came back and sanded it with a 220 grit sanding block, and then applied the second coat. This is also the same stuff I used to seal up all the cedar soffit quite a while ago. With that done, I can start finishing up the siding and doing all the other finishing touches. By the way, if you like that song, it's available on Apple Music, Spotify, everything else. And it was actually written right here in this shop. So now, after a long two and a half months, I'm finally on to my last step of this build. Or at least the exterior. So this is just some regular six inch aluminum fascia cap. With the first piece here, I'm just marking a one inch tick and then cutting this up on only that lower bent over section. Then I can score this tab with a knife and just wiggle it until it pops off. And then using a square, I scored another line along the back side of the fascia right along that one inch mark. And then just used a hand brake to bend that up to 90 degrees. And now that's a good little end cap that we can use to start our run of fascia. To install this, I just wiggled this up right underneath the drip edge until it was flush with the soffit. And then this just gets nailed in every couple feet along that bottom edge. I'm using aluminum trim nails for this and I found it easier to actually pre-drill the fascia first because it's easy to ding the fascia otherwise. And then I just started working away panel after panel. Where pieces overlap, I'd give them about an inch of overlap, and then just put a nail right up through both sheets. Once I got to the end of the run, I'd make another piece with one of those one inch bent over end caps. To start the gable ends, I'd first measure out the bird box as well as the vertical portion up to the soffit there. And then I'd transfer this on to just a scrap piece of fascia. I'd also make a mark an inch further so I can bend it around the corner and make a mark at the one inch point. 
So start at the one inch point, I would just cut off this bent over tab here and then make a 45 degree miter. Then I'd cut my cut line and cut just the bottom portion of this bend line. And then I'd use my square to score a line along that bend line and use a handbrake to bend that over 90 degrees. Then I just transferred on that second vertical measurement I took and cut along the bend to this point and then just bend this over roughly to the slope of the roof. Then this cap just slides over the end and I just put one tack in it for now. For the next piece I just measured from the bottom end of that peak down into the corner of the bird box there and then marked this out on a fresh sheet. So my peak's at 86 inches but I'm actually going to put another tick one inch further and then I'm using my square to get that same 33 and a half degree slope of the roof and then I'm going to cut this line. On the bottom side I cut that inch back line and then just scored these two pieces apart. Where this piece overlaps with the bird box, I just cut up this bottom mark and then scored this tab off. So I left this piece a couple inches long and then I'm just gonna trace this edge. And I just have this tack nailed at the top so I can actually pull this bottom part out and then cut this line. And then with everything looking pretty flush, I can just nail this into place like so. The next piece is made almost the exact same way. I just made the angled cut right on the measurement this time, not an inch further. And then those two pieces should meet right in the middle of this peak. With that first piece being cut an inch longer, I still have that inch overlap here too. And then these last two pieces are made the exact same way. I just had to score that bottom edge off a little bit further where these pieces overlap the lower fascia. And that's the last step of this build. After watching the seasons change from the middle of summer to the beginning of winter and challenging my construction ability for two and a half months, 10 hours a day, the exterior of my tiny house and by far the nicest thing I have ever built is now fully complete. By the way, if you watch the entire one hour and 38 minutes of this build, you are my hero. So the final dimensions of this, including the overhangs, is 12 feet wide and about 13 foot 10 high. With these dimensions, it can be hauled pretty much anywhere with just a wide load permit. I'm not sure of the weight, but I wouldn't think it's anything more than six or 7,000 pounds right now. In total, to get me to this point, it's cost about $65,000 Canadian. Inside, it's got just over 300 square feet and a little more once I add a loft. Obviously, I'm still pretty far away from living in this, but I'm gonna be tackling the inside in some of my next videos. Oh, and I'm still designing that, so if you have any really cool ideas for the inside, leave them in the comments below. 
As you can tell by the length and the amount of detail, I put my heart and soul into every single one of my videos and I absolutely love making them for you. This video contains over 2,000 separate clips and 4 terabytes of footage. It was shot working full time for two and a half months using only my camera and a tripod. I edited this whole video myself and it took another two weeks just to complete the video. And my point in this is basically, hit that subscribe button. I really hope I inspired some people to think outside the box when it comes to housing, especially in today's world where it feels like it's impossible to get ahead. Believe me, I know the feeling, it's the whole reason this YouTube channel started in the first place. But now I'm one step closer to moving out of my parents' basement. If you enjoyed this video, you can also follow me on my Instagram. I'm going to be doing some giveaways on there that aren't going to be announced on YouTube, so that's the place to hear about them.